when I think about friendship, and that's what we've been looking at, there's, I, I remember this distinct moment when I was about nine or 10, maybe even 11 years old, my mom came home and found me crying on my bedroom floor. Gabriel, honey, what is wrong? What's going on? I said, Mom, Ernest does not have any friends. Now, what had happened is I had just watched Ernest goes to camp. And Ernest goes to camp, it's so, supposed to be a comedy, and yet it became like a very sad story for me. Ernest had no friends. I, uh, you know, one thing that I think is true of me, I don't always do it well. I oftentimes, maybe like you, wear my failures more than my successes. But friendship is something that I truly do value. In one of my very favorite movies, It's a Wonderful Life, at the very end, I cry all the time. Now, most of you think it's so boring, you're sleeping at this point. But when it gets to this, my favorite part, and the, the, the bell rings and that whole scene, and then he reopens the book and there's an inscription that says, remember, no man is a failure who has friends. A lot of times we gauge our successes based on what we are able to accumulate through a lifetime. But if you're here tonight and you can genuinely say you have a friend, you indeed are richly blessed by the Lord. Friendship is a gift from the Lord. We are created, we are designed not to isolate ourselves, but to exist in community with one another. So that was my makeshift intro. That was not what I wrote down, but that's what we have to do tonight. We're going to look at Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17. And I want us to consider tonight a proverb, a picture, and a promise. A proverb, a picture, and a promise. Proverbs 17, verse 17. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. This is an example of Hebrew parallelism where the author then, he says it, and then he, he says it again with a little bit of a nuance, and it emphasizes the point to make an even stronger point, and the point that the author here, probably Solomon, is saying is like, hey, it's one thing for you to have a family that when everything goes wrong, family's still there, but it's another thing if God gives you a friend that when everything goes wrong, you still have a friend. And for the people of God, we are called to be such a friend. A lot of times we wanna build a friend that would be perfect for us, but the reality is we have to become a friend that we would be good for somebody else. And so we need to be that friend. A friend is loyal. A friend is loyal. It's one of the greatest characteristics of friendship, I believe. Like if we were to do Family Feud up here and we had the board and said, what are the top 10 characteristics of friendship? It wouldn't take long before one of the contestants would come to loyalty. And loyal to bing, and it's on the board. Loyalty. Now, loyalty is something that we need to strive to be as friends. And that doesn't mean blanket loyalty. It doesn't mean that if you have somebody who's abusing you or somebody who's just treating you like a, a rug or a mat of some sort, it's like that you're just, well, I'm going to keep being loyal, right? But it means that we are to stick close to them. One of the greatest, I think, pictures of this Now you think about Job's friends. They did a phenomenal job initially when they just came and they were present with Job, but then they opened their mouths and they messed up. I think about Ruth who stayed with Naomi. You remember as they're they're heading back to the land of Israel, Naomi now has lost her husband and her two sons, and she tells her daughters-in-law to stay, but Ruth says what? It says that she clinged, she clung to her mother-in-law, said, you, I will go with you. I will not leave you. Your people will be my people, your God, my God. But maybe the greatest picture in the Old Testament is that of David and Jonathan. You remember in 1 Samuel chapter 8, Israel demands a king. We want a king like all the nations. And what they wanted was somebody tall and strong and handsome like Saul, who seemed like he had all the qualifications to be a great king. And yet, it is not long into his tenure by 1 Samuel chapter 15, the Lord rejects him because of his disobedience and sin. And in chapter 16, David, the one after God's own heart, is anointed as king. And you think about the way that we're used to kingship, monarchy. In fact, it was Queen Elizabeth 
My daughter Charlotte is infatuated with Queen Elizabeth. She just got a bobblehead. The head broke off. I got to fix it. Like for a month now. Daddy, can we fix that head? Yeah, we're going to fix that head. I still haven't done it. I don't really know how to fix a bobblehead because I don't know how to do it. Like, I think it's just going to be stuck. But anyway, she's infatuated with Queen Elizabeth, right? But now her son has taken the throne. And it goes by line of family secession. You would think here then, okay, well, God has now rejected Saul. It must be Jonathan's turn. But Jonathan is not the one that God selects. He seems like he's a faithful person. Seems like he fears the Lord. He's had a lot of great characteristics, but God has chosen David. And you would think it'd be very easy for Jonathan then to be like the same heart that his father had, jealous of David. And instead of coming and working together with Saul to kill David, it is Jonathan the Lord uses to protect David from Saul. And there's a great picture of their friendship. In fact, even after Jonathan is dead, and we see the great lamentation which David mourns for him at the end of 1 Samuel, at the beginning of 2 Samuel, in 2 Samuel chapter 9, he asks, is there anyone in the household of Saul that I can show great mercy to, that I can honor. And you remember that his son Mephibosheth, I can never say that word, I hope that's right. We'll test it later. Mephibosheth has brought, and he was hurt, his legs were broken, and he never healed completely, but for the rest of time, he came and he sat at the table of King David because such was the bond that David and Jonathan had. It's a beautiful picture. Maybe. If you're not as familiar with the Old Testament, you're familiar with the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Samwise Gamgee, he's my guy, right? If you need a sidekick, you think, well, I better get, it's Batman and Robin. But you need to go with Samwise Gamgee. Samwise is the guy who's going to get you to where you need to go. And you and I need to be Samwise Gamgees. You know, in our heads, we're always making it that we are the hero of our stories, but God is calling us more likely to be the Samwise Gamgee in somebody else's life than to be the hero in our own lives. So that's just a little bit of a picture of what loyalty looks like. And then finally, a promise. A promise. In Proverbs 18, 24, it says, A man of many companions comes to ruin, but there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. So when you think about friendship and the Lord's Supper, how do you get to the Lord's Supper from friendship? It's very easy when you read this proverb. It's not, I don't have to do a lot of work for you tonight to see where we're going. There is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. In the greatest of all the Gospels, the Gospel of John, you guys know this is the greatest. In chapter 13, it, we're getting into the second half of the book, and we're told this, that Having loved his own, Jesus now loved them to the end. Jesus is the friend that sticks closer than a brother, better than Jonathan and David, better than Samwise Gamgee. Jesus is faithful. In fact, in Revelation, that is the name he is known by, faithful and true. And so when we come to the Lord's Supper, it's also in that same discourse in chapter 15 that Jesus says, I call you friends. No greater love than this is the, for anyone than a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, it's hard to get up here and preach. It kind of helped to have, be so quick. But a lot of times I can, in my mind, rehearse all the failures I've had as a friend when I have not been loyal. I remember in sixth grade, we, my family was moving from Altizer on Crane Avenue over to Beverly Hills. Now, Beverly Hills, not the same kind like in uh, Los Angeles, California, but a step up from Altizer in Huntington, West Virginia. And as we were moving, I had a friend knock on the door. His name was Chris Green. And he was brokenhearted because I was moving. And you think, well, that, that's, that seems right. Friends are sad. But he was brokenhearted, not necessarily just because I was moving, because... I didn't tell him I was moving. And it seems like a small thing, but for a fifth grade boy, that really hurt him. I was not loyal. And that's just kind of a, a small story. And I'm sure you can think about friendships and things like, man, I feel like I'm not loyal, but that is the truth of all of us, right? That we're not perfect. 
But we serve a perfect God, the one who is loyal and sticks closer to a brother than anyone else we have. And so that whatever failure we may bring to him, whether it's in friendships, finances, sexual relationships, whatever failure it is, we bring it to him. And John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the same grace that empowers that forgiveness is the same grace that empowers you to be a loyal friend and wherever else God is working on you to grow in holiness. And so we're about to come to this table together to remember what the friend who sticks close in their brother has done for us, that he laid down his life for his friends. So tonight you may think, well, can I take the Lord's Supper, Pastor? Well, absolutely. If you're a believer, you've been baptized, you believe in the true gospel of the true King, you're seeking to walk by faith and not by sight, you know that as our pastor says, it's two steps forward, a step back. If that's the heartbeat of you have, we would encourage you to take the Lord's Supper tonight. Pastor Philip's going to come. Timothy Babatunde, our deacon, they're going to come and lead us now in this time as we gather around the table together. If you are looking for a gluten-free option, we have it right back here at the uh, corner back here, and I'll be back there to serve you. I'm going to pray, and I, I hope that you're encouraged that even when we fail, maybe you've had friends that have failed you, maybe you've been a friend who's failed, we have a Lord who sticks closer than a brother. He forgives us in our failures. He empowers us for faithful, loyal friendship. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, who is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Father, we pray that you would help us by your grace to be good friends. Lord, there may be somebody here who's really hurting, thinking, I don't have a friend. Would you, in your good kindness, give them a lifelong friend? And Father, we pray for the community here at Ninth and O that we would not be superficial, but that you would give us a depth and a love for one another that brings glory to King Jesus. Strengthen us now in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.